I think that uh, you, there's probably not much point in doing a meta-analysis if you haven't got access to all of the, the studies that you, you want to analyze. So most meta-analyses that I've seen start with some sort of systematic review. Uh, and this can take a long, long time. It probably, if, if you're going to do a systematic review and then a meta-analysis, at least the first half of the study would, would be taken up by the systematic review and then extracting the evidence. Depending on the size of your field, your research field, you may choose not to do, not, not to continue. So the idea of a systematic review is then to find all the evidence that exists on a topic or a question. If you can find it all, then there shouldn't be any selection bias. So there sh you shouldn't be left with any missing studies or that you've missed because you don't know a particular literature or a particular journal. And if you can produce an unbiased review, you could then produce a minimally biased meta-analysis. So it kind of depends on getting an unbiased review to start with. Um, so if you are going to do a meta-analysis, I'd be interested to hear if you have a, have a view on why would you not do a do a systematic review as well. I think it's kind of implied that you normally do a systematic review before a meta-analysis. There are many ways in which what you read is biased. The most, the most common one that people talk about is a publication bias. So lots of studies are done, only some are published. And there's various reasons for that. We can talk about them. I made up this one. So you think about how much time you have to read through studies and which studies you choose to read. So you may know that there are 100 studies on a topic, but maybe you only read 10 of them. And so you are now biased by the fact that you've only read 10. And, and how did you choose those 10? Perhaps you looked at the citations, for example. So it probably won't surprise you to learn that citations are tend to be biased towards uh, white male Western professors. So, so those studies tend to get tend to get cited more than others. And that's like a historical or societal biases in, in the way that we tend to cite studies. Uh, there was a nice example a couple of years ago on Twitter that I saw two, two very similar papers in the same journal, I think, and one had a, a name that sounded Western and one had a name that sounded Middle Eastern, I think it was. And the, the, the Western sounding name was, was rated more highly, was cited more often. You know, that's, there are all these in, intrinsic biases that we should try and get rid of when we're doing our science. Um, so yeah, look at who you're citing when you cite papers. Do you just pick the, the most fancy journal to cite a paper when you try and show that you found evidence for something? Same sort of thing with journals, like science and nature, the journals are obviously cited a lot. The media report studies from particular journals more than others, and some not at all. But scientists, we do it ourselves. We choose which journals we want to include in our, in our papers. We choose high profile journals to cite because we think it will be more convincing. So we are part of the, we are the problem. There's no, you know, scientists are creating these biases by, by choosing to cite one thing and not another. If you have a, a paper by a Nobel prize winning author from Oxford University, uh, it's likely that you're more likely to include that as one of your citations than someone who didn't win a Nobel prize or from Middlesex University. And that's nothing to do with what's the content of those papers. It's entirely due to the names on the front page. So that's a pretty common bias. Same thing for langu language and country. We're all lucky, I guess, to be in an English speaking country and English speaking in institutions that English is the main language. And it's now pretty much the universal language of science, which is very lucky for us. But there are still papers being published in non English languages from non-English countries and non-European and non-Western. So it's actually very hard. I mean, I, I never include non-English papers in my in my reading, in my meta-analysis, because I can't understand them and I, I can't pay for someone to translate them. But this bias still exists. Um, hopefully Google and AI, but maybe the one thing they could do for us is really good translations of scientific non-English papers. And then we could really include all, all papers in our analyses. And then just the, the keywords you use and the, the way you phrase your article, the way the, the, the words you put in your titles and abstracts, that is going to bias the likelihood of them being read and cited. And so all these biases exist and um, it's very hard to overcome them. But the idea is in systematic review, you're going to attempt to correct for some of these biases. You can't correct them all. You just can't. And you won't know, you won't know that you're not, not seeing papers because you won't find them. It's the unknown unknowns you won't find a lot of a lot of work that is directly relevant to your question. But you have to try. And that's the point of doing a systematic review. So the entire literature is extremely biased. I think that's a fair, that's a very gentle way of putting it.
if you're going to do a systematic review, you can. There's guidance out there, and there's some really good resources. One important one to look for is Prospero. This is run by the University of York, and they provide a prospective register of systematic reviews. So if you're going to do a systematic review and you haven't started, then you should register your study with Prospero. You put in all the details of your study, and they they provide a really detailed template. And just by doing the doing the registration itself, you're going to learn a lot about how to do a systematic review. And they've changed their they've changed their rules recently. So you you can't submit to Prospero if you've already started looking at the data. Um, it used to be the case that you could say I'm halfway through and I'm now registering, but they've they've tightened up. So you have to think in advance what data you want to extract, and then you can register your study as a pre-registration. So it's it's a very nice thing, and they've been doing it for years, and they publish papers on how to do systematic reviews, and they publish a lot of systematic reviews, particularly medical reviews. And according to this latest paper, six years ago, they've got 30,000 reviews have been registered in their database. A second essential piece of guidance for doing systematic reviews is the PRISMA statement and the PRISMA guidance, and they tell you how to report your systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And if you're doing this after you've started work on your meta-analysis, it's going to be more work because you have to go back and change things and, and, and collect the data again. So let me show you an example. So if you go to Prisma, they produce all sorts of templates, uh, flow, a flow diagram, let's see if that works. And it's basically just a, it's a flowchart diagram that tells you what you need to report at different stages. So hopefully you've seen some of these before. At all stages of your review, you have to keep track of how many articles you've looked at, how many of you screened, how many you've removed, how many you've included. Uh, it's actually quite a lot of work to keep track of this. So you really have to do it from the beginning. Every time you open a PDF, you have to write, put a one in a column or a tick in a box on your own record, just so you haven't, just so you have these numbers. They're really hard to recreate retrospectively. You definitely need to do Prisma and you should definitely do um, anything that helps you structure your review to basically to save you a lot of time. And if you include a Prisma diagram, then you pass one of the sort of pre-publication checks that, that some journals will ask for you. Oh yeah, there's an, there's an example. I've, so this is my last one I did published in January, I think. So I went through, I went through 660 studies to begin with. I collected 190 studies from the references of the studies that I'd already found. So in total, I looked at 782 studies, and then at each stage, I screened the title, and then I screened the abstract, and I wrote down reasons for excluding at each stage. So which you, you won't understand these codes probably, but the point is you have a, an itemized list of why you include or exclude an article. So from 782 articles, I've ended up with 50 experiments, and those are the things that I included and that wasn't a meta-analysis. They were too different. I couldn't meta-analyze them, but they, they all did some one thing similar. And that's what I reviewed in the paper. So yeah, it's a lot of work to, to do these Prisma things, but once you've got it and once you've started, it's, it's much quicker at the end to do it prospectively rather than retrospectively. So the idea is you should screen maybe a thousand articles and for everyone you have a reason you can put it into a code why you've included or why you've excluded. Uh, another bit of guidance, this, acronym called PICO. It's used as a shorthand for what you're doing and, and why, and what it is you're measuring. So um, every systematic review meta-analysis, you should be able to identify, and some, for some journals, it's you must be able to identify what's the population you're studying, whether it's participants, animals, or computers, whatever it is you're studying. What's the intervention or treatment or conditions you're applying to those people? It could be a, a drug, or it could be an exercise regime, or it could be an experimental condition in the lab. How do you know that your intervention has done anything? So what's the control group or the comparator? Is it a different condition? Is it a different time? Is it a different group? And then how do you know that anything had any effect at all? So what is your what are you actually measuring? So who, who they are, what you do to them, what you're controlling it with, and what are you measuring? And if you can't say what those four things are, then you, you can't really start a review or a meta-analysis. And it could be multiple things in each in each in each case, but the simplest case, you'd have one of each of these. So one population, one intervention, one comparison, and one outcome. And that will help get down from a thousand studies in your original search to maybe 10 or five. If you're going to do a systematic review, um, this is a hard one, and I've never actually achieved this in any of my work. You need to find a friend who also wants to review those 1,000 papers with you. <laughs> 
in my experience that that doesn't happen if you're if you're paid on a project and you've got two people working on it and you can both spend as much time on this project that's great but ideally in the guidance they'll say that you need to have two reviewers for everything as much as possible or you could have maybe some overlap but the idea is you should search the literature decide whether to include each article's extract the data and assess the quality of the studies in parallel with another person and independently and another approach which is quite good is if you have say a thousand studies to review you could maybe take 550 or 600 studies each and so there's an overlap in the middle and that two reviewers could do 500 studies each and then an additional 100 which they both do and then you could you'd have some measurement of whether, whether you're doing the same thing uh, and some some people do this using an army of, of undergraduate or perhaps phd students maybe you've been included uh, in this in this joyful gift but yeah it's a really hard one to achieve because you're doubling the amount of work that's already a lot of work a slightly easier one or a criterion that most sort of quality guides will tell you you need to do this is to use two or more databases so if i almost exclusively use pubmed to get my work and whenever i've used something else it hasn't provided any more any more helpful articles so i'm quite biased and i'll just do it in pubmed and then try and find other things to do a, like a proper high quality systematic review you should use two or more databases so, so a good one to go to next is embase so pubmed and embase are two good citation abstract uh, databases embase is slightly bigger and embase includes things like conference reports that pubmed doesn't so pubmed is basically public published medical articles whereas embase is also includes conferences and other abstracts and that's they're both sort of medical biological sciences if you're on the psychological end there are lots of journals psychological journals which are not included in either of those and then scopus covers the humanities as well um, but you can see the numbers as as, as it's covering all of <laughs> all of academia pretty much um, there's now nearly 100 million articles to search for so if you can choose two probably the top two but you might still be missing a small proportion of articles when you publish your review you have to say exactly how you found the articles so you want to generate you want to generate a search string which gives you quite a comprehensive list of articles to start with and there are two problems here one is that you've got your search needs to be narrow enough to get down from 37 million articles in pubmed to maybe a thousand to, to start your review but maybe ideally more like 20 at the end so it should be narrow enough to get down to a manageable number but also wide enough to actually find all the articles that are relevant you'll see that you'll need to use search terms in your string including and or not wildcards people typically also include or exclude say the species which in my case would usually be human um, the population you're studying could be a healthy adults or a clinical sample the language of the article almost everyone uses english and then you can also specify the study type in these databases um, and this is my latest one that i'm the one that i'm doing this is the string i've been using so that's the kind of thing once i've got that string i can just click on the click on the link to pubmed and get last time i looked it was 388 articles and so i've got various keywords that i know are relevant i've got um, some booleans to expand so it's maybe some of them use some words and some use others but these are all pretty important i've got wildcards to allow in this case it's afferent or afferents or or sense would be sensory or sensation or sensing inhibition or inhibitory facilitation or facilitator facilitatory i've crafted a string which gets me a large number and when i first ran this search i assumed that 100 would be relevant from this search but actually more like 300 were relevant and that's when i that's when i decided to have a think about whether it was worth doing so you need to come up with a string that finds as many of the papers as possible without excluding too many and without missing too many and that's entirely up to your own discretion to try and sort that out you'll have a good idea about how how common this this method or this thing that you're trying to analyze is and so whether it's for your topic it might be five studies or it could be five thousand could be 500 and it's very hard to know without being an expert what's the right number of studies to include in your meta-analysis there's a thing called the gray literature and that is unpublished data essentially um, so it could be a student project it could be findings that someone think is negative it could be uh, really bad studies uh, it could be studies that someone's had no time or interest in publishing it could be articles that they've tried to publish but have been rejected 
And finding these has been very difficult historically. Um, it's easier now because for these things, for these reasons, uh, we now have preprint, so you can find studies that were maybe proposed or submitted, but never got to a formal publication in PubMed. There are various um, student theses, BSc, MSc, masters and PhD thesis can be found on the internet much easier. Lots of universities publish their undergraduate theses now, which is great on their own repositories. And then yeah, Embase includes conference abstracts. And if you've gone through all these options and you still think there's more papers you haven't found, you could just try emailing uh, the authors of those papers that you have found already to say, do you have any more? Is this all you've got? Uh, have you got any students who've just finished a project? You know, and that could easily double or triple, or who knows how many, who, many, who knows how many papers there are out there that haven't been published. It's very difficult to answer. But if, again, if you do a proper systematic review, this needs to be part of your part of your approach, and it's something that I haven't done for reasons of time. That's why I'm not an expert in these things because I, I haven't done them properly. But you're supposed to search the grey literature, or at least attempt to. Um, and Google Scholar is pretty good, actually. It'll find find a lot of master's theses and things that that you can't find elsewhere. One thing I've always done, so you start, you do your pub, say your PubMed search, you get say a list of a hundred papers, and then you go through the reference lists of all those papers. And that has led to lots more. And you'll start to realize why you haven't found them in the normal way. They maybe use different keywords, different ways of phrasing their, their findings, um, or they will be the kind of gray literature that you can't find elsewhere. So the reference lists are very good. But again, quite time consuming. So for every hundred, if you've got a hundred articles, you've also got a hundred reference lists to check through. And if each paper has 50 references, you've got 5,000 references to check through. They'll be largely overlapping, of course. And now thanks to, um, thanks to Google Scholar and Web of Science, you can also search forward in time. So references, we're always looking backwards in time from where a paper refers to backwards. Since we have these citation abstracts, uh, dissertations, uh, sorry, citation databases now, we can look forwards in time as well. I tend not to do this because I think it's just, you end up with a very, very large number, but you definitely, if you've got very few studies and you, you suspect that um, you're missing some, you can look forward in time to see who's been citing your study. Another thing which is thought of as good and not, so it's not biased, it's seen as a good thing, is if you are, if you already know that there are other articles which you haven't found through your search, then you should definitely include them as well. So that's seen as a good thing. It feels a bit feels a bit biased to me that you're choosing to include stuff that you know about, but apparently it's a good thing. Whatever you, whatever you can do to include more more articles, more potential sources of information, then you should. More is always better, I think, in this case. The example I showed you in the first in introduction, there were three studies in a meta-analysis. Nothing wrong with that. If those if those are the only three studies that exist in that literature, then then that's it. You found all the studies. And I, I happen to know that in that particular example, there were actually many more studies which they'd missed. That's one of the problems with that meta analysis, but not the one that you couldn't have seen. You could do it with two. I mean, there's there's nothing there's nothing statistically wrong with doing a meta analysis with two studies. I'm not sure what you can conclude from that. I've seen a lot a lot of meta analyses and systematic reviews with about 20. That seems to be a, a good, nice, manageable number that you could definitely do, say, within your PhD or within a single research project. That seems about the right number for me to, to do a maybe for a first meta-analysis or systematic review. I'm currently doing one that's this big and it's going to take me all year and that's that's a shame but I've decided I'm committed now. <laughs> I'm locked in. Um, and if it was if it was something like if you were trying to meta-analyze say 2,000 studies this this is not something a single person can do. You need a, a massive team of researchers, maybe a whole career, maybe some AI but it's if you end up with 2000 studies, then you're, it's not going to happen, essentially, unless you've got a lot of money and a lot of friends. So I would aim for, try and find about 20 articles if you can. And if you can't, then either ask a different question or do something else with your time. If it's really important, then maybe, yeah, maybe you can set aside a whole year of your career to do one big meta analysis. That's just my guess about um, the scale of things. Aim for about 20, maybe. Once you've got your 20 studies, you found, so you've done your systematic review, you've got your 20 studies, you need to look at them, you need to read them and assess them. And something that many meta-analyses just don't do is assess the quality of the studies. And this guides me, this guides my thinking and reading a lot. There's, there's lots and lots of really bad studies out there, but some, some amazing ones. So um, how do you try and assess which are good and which are bad? 
and how do you include the good ones and exclude the bad ones it's very difficult and it's always going to be a bit subjective that the the cochrane collaboration have the, these tools called risk of bias they're kind of checklists and they're sort of guidance to how to how to go about assessing studies and they've they've recently expanded um, you've got tools for randomized trials for non-randomized trials um, for evidence syntheses uh, for interventions and for now for a new one for systematic review and they've all got um, nice names rob robbins or rob fizz uh, those tools are, i find them a bit a bit clunky like because they're, they're supposed to apply to ev every possible kind of study you have to kind of see which of those items if you're using their checklists which items really apply to your studies and which don't but it's a very good place to start working out how to objectively assess the quality of your studies i tend to use my own criteria i tend to sort of include some of these and then add my own ones that i think are really specific for the field yeah they're a bit i find them a bit clunky but you can adapt them and i think whatever you do use you need to make some attempt to to objectively assess study quality without without just saying well the best papers are published in nature by old white professors that's that's often not the case so um you need to find some way that that you can re reproducibly categorize and quantify the um the studies that you're using the quality of the studies that you're using final things i want to say is that in the past i think this is very much hopefully this is the past but um what people tend to do is write a paper so they'll do they'll do a year's work to do their systematic review and meta-analysis they'll write a paper they'll put that paper behind a paywall so you can't actually read it unless you unless you're um in an in, you know in a university and you've got a subscription they'll bury all the data in figures which are very hard to read and then it might be cited quite a lot it's likely not really read in any detail so there's a new movement starting about five years ago to um essentially do living systematic reviews where you produce all this data and all your tables and your criteria and then you make them fully open fully digital and live on the internet uh for, and there's guidance now there's four or five papers uh, i'm going to start one soon but the idea is that and especially during covid this was really critical that the whole world wanted the same information as quickly as possible and the the covid deniers out there would propose all these these wonderful systematic reviews and evidence for or against vaccines for example and the world wanted a quick a quick way to assess does this study add anything to our knowledge about say vaccine effectiveness and so covid really um boosted the work of this group Lift living systematic review network so as every individual study comes out someone assesses the study maybe once a month they add the data to a, a web page it automatically updates all the systematic reviews conclusions and the meta-analyses and then you have a new conclusion you know there'll be a july conclusion for this um for whether covid vaccines work for example and then an august conclusion that's got to be the future because this takes a lot of work and putting it in a dusty paper that no one's ever going to read just seems like a big waste of time uh, at least the very least you can do is make your the results of your systematic review and meta-analysis freely available in a table that's easy to download and easy to use um, but traditionally they just end up in a paper